Jeff, uh, you're good now, so uh, can you just start it again uh, from the beginning? I, I will do that. Thank you, Jay. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jay. We're happy to be a part of Midas' ongoing webinar series, and I'll talk a little bit about how we use this program. Uh, what we're going to cover today, uh, I'll briefly I'll talk about our motivation for using the MIDAS program on this project. Second, I'll give you a quick overview of the project itself and, and the particular bridge. And then we'll dive into the heart of the talk, which focuses on development of the MIDAS model and some of the results we got. And then finally, we'll go over that results and discuss how they compare to some other uh, programs, commercial programs. We opted to develop a MIDAS model for several reasons. Uh, first of all, this is a complex bridge, and we really wanted to increase our level of confidence in both the analysis and design. We wanted to make sure we were capturing everything that went on and didn't miss any crucial elements. Uh, second, it gives us a tool that can address more than just superstructure design. So we can go beyond just designing the steel girders and the cross frames. Uh, things we can look at include construction sequencing, and not just a deck pour, but actual erection of the steel girders themselves. We can look at thermal deformation and figure out what displacement demands are being passed on to each bearing or support. We can also look at seismic demands and figure out how the seismic force is distributed to the various substructure units. Another reason to look at this was the uh, shortcomings of traditional steel design software. Uh, for example, uh, people who have used MDX might, might realize that sometimes you get pretty high demands in your cross frames. Uh, we know why MDX is generating those, but we're not really sure that uh, they're, they're truly realistic of what's going on. And then finally, it gave us an example to learn and evaluate the MIDAS program itself. Well, this bridge is part of a very large design build project. It's called the Ohio River Bridges. Uh, it involves crossings over the Ohio River between Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, those are the two owners of the project. It actually consists of two separate projects. We have the East End Crossing, which the Indiana Department of Transportation has taken the lead on. And we have the Downtown Crossing, which the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet has taken the lead on. The Downtown Crossing contains the bridge we'll be talking about today. It has a approximately $860 million project value, that is both design and construction. It was split into three sections, one, two, and three. And you can see the aerial over on the left there has the the uh, blue, yellow, and red color coding the sections. The junctions of Interstate 64, 65, and 71 come together in downtown Louisville, and that's locally known as the Kennedy Interchange, uh, or also sometimes referred to as the Spaghetti Junction. Section 1 rebuilds this interchange in its current place, and uh, the concept plans call for 41 permanent bridges, and the rendering on the right there uh, shows a the uh, the image of what the rebuilt interchange should look like. It involves both a mix of eye girders and tubs using both steel and concrete. Bridge AO37 is one of the 41 bridges in Section 1 of the Downtown Crossing Project. It's approximately 952 feet long and 34 feet wide. It consists of two units. Unit 1 has pre-stressed concrete girders. It's about 340 feet long and is divided into three spans. Unit 2 is constructed with steel eye girders. It's approximately 611 feet long and consists of five spans. Multi-column pier bents are used for all the substructures, and they're constructed with reinforced concrete. Now, this slide shows the general layout sheet, and, and I realize you cannot read the text that's on there, but I wanted to try to capture an overview of this, this whole bridge. Those orange circles there show the Unit 2. Uh, which is what we modeled and analyzed in MIDAS. Uh, zooming in, it gives you a little, bit, a little better idea of this bridge. Again, about uh, 600 feet long, uh, steel plate girders, five spans. Uh, the cross section on the bottom there, again, showing you the, the three girders, about 34 feet out to out. Now, MDX was used for the design of this bridge, and there are a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, the pursuit work for this job was done within MDX, so we had a real good starting point. Two, the project had an approved software list. MIDAS was not on that initial list, and we did not request its inclusion because we simply didn't own MIDAS at the start of this job. 
And finally, Midas did not have steel capabilities when we started this project. That's something that's been added within the last month, and our plans were due earlier this year. Design started on this bridge in August of 2013. We had an estimated completion date, and that was final RFC, uh, around uh, April of this year. And that actually kind of pushed into May due to changes and pauses. Uh, the majority of those were, were contractor requested as we started to look at different scenarios and different ways of, of building things. Well, as you saw in that general layout sheet, the bridge has some complex geometry. Uh, we have curved girder segments, even some straight segments. Uh, the substructures have varying skews, and then the framing plan uh, ended up being somewhat complex as well. You can see here on the screen, we also have nine discrete pour regions for the concrete deck. And so considering all this, we used AutoCAD to develop the girder geometry. We also were able to go in and figure out how we wanted to discretize those girders along the line and also create dummy deck elements, which is something I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. We were able to save a DXF and then import this into MIDAS. All other geometry for the model was developed within MIDAS itself. At this time, I'm going to leave the PowerPoint and we're going to go into MIDAS and we'll walk through a bunch of uh, what we did for the model development. So, uh, so here we are in MIDAS. For those that are familiar with it or maybe haven't seen it, this is the interface. Uh, you're seeing the entire bridge model here. And I have the uh, extruded view turned on so you can see the element cross sections. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a minute so you can uh, see some of this a little better. Well, the first thing I want to talk about was section properties. Uh, this refers to your elements such as frames and plates. In the tree menu over here to the left, you can see we have properties section. And if I expand that, that brings up all the prop section properties we have defined within this model. We used Midas's composite section property to model the girder plus the tributary deck area. I can go ahead and select this first group so you can see. Here you go, these little uh, the red line indicates the elements that have the property composite one hyphen A assigned to them. That nomenclature is this composite section for girder one, part A, A, B, C, D. Those are just increments we had to keep track of the various uh, plate sections along the girder. The composite sections themselves are defined with this, within this data sheet. And you can see, again, we've got a, a tributary slab width up top, uh, the steel girder down here, and all the necessary geometry defined over here. And as, also, as well, you get material properties. So pretty uh, uh, robust uh, data entry form that allows us to get all those properties in relatively quickly. We ended up with a total of 40 unique composite section properties. Uh, the number was so high because of variations in, in plate sizes, you know, again, different uh, flange thicknesses and widths, uh, different tributary deck widths for the interior and exterior girders, and also being able to accommodate the deck port in sequence. Well, I would mentioned dummy deck elements earlier, uh, and what those refer to is we need a way to, dis to connect these discrete girder lines that we've modeled with the composite section properties. Really, we want to mimic the diaphragm action of the deck itself. And that was done with beam elements that connect these girder lines. Well, I scroll down a little bit, you can see all these little W sections. Again, here we have W61 was a bunch of these dummy deck elements connecting the girders. You can see it's got a, an eight and a half inch thickness, which is the stru structural thickness of the deck, and a tributary width of 61 inches. Those widths varied along the bridge depending on how we had discretized the girder. In the end, we had to have 32 different elements defined to accommodate all the required widths. We also used a weightless material for these dummy elements. Again, all we're after is the stiffness of the diaphragm action. The weight of the deck is already accounted for elsewhere within the program. Uh, the steel cross frames were defined with uh, your typical AISC steel members. You can see over here we've got a, an angle iron, for example, uh, you know, 6 by 6 by 9 sixteenths. Uh, that defined a lot of the top cords and diagonals. A couple other uh, angle sections here that 
were used along the bridge. Able to pull that in directly from a database. So again, AISC database, drop down list to choose a section you want. So pretty convenient. And then finally, we used various solid cross sections to model the peer cap and the peer column. We defined three materials with this in the model. We had a grade 50 steel that was used for all the uh, girders, cross frame, structural steel elements. We had a 4,000 PSI concrete. And then we had a weightless concrete for those dummy deck elements. The weightless concrete was also a, a, a 4,000 PSI strength. We ended up using that weightless concrete for all the uh, substructure units as well. And the reason being is that we wanted to be able to get total vertical reactions and compare that to hand calcs for just a superstructure. It's important to note that MIDAS does support time-dependent material properties, uh, but we do not consider the, those in, the, in our analysis. Uh, obviously, it could be something you may want to consider depending upon your project. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about local nodal axes. For a curved bridge, it's often easier to work in the radial and tangential directions. This is especially true if you think about the bearings at all your substructure units. To help with that, we defined local axes, which corresponded to the radial and tangential directions at each pier on the curve. First, I'm going to turn off this extruded view. And now I can turn on these local axes. So again, you can see at this pier we have uh, a tangential the, the x-axis is tangential, the y-axis is radial, and that just facilitates uh, input for various things. You might also notice that we have some local axes at, the, at these cross frames. And those, uh, those are allowed us to uh, define restraints that are ultimately required for, for computational stability. Uh, and what I'm referring to here is that the cross frames themselves were modeled as truss elements, so they only have an axial force. Therefore, we needed to provide some out-of-plane restraint at that knee. And local axis, axes really facilitated the definition of such restraints. That gives us a good segue to the next part of this talk, and that's the boundary conditions. We, had a variety, we used a mix of support conditions on this, on this model. First, I'm going to zoom back out to the entire view. Uh, rigid supports. Well, we used rigid supports to enforce full fixity at the bottom of the pier columns. We also used them to prevent transverse and vertical translation at abutment number two, that being the far abutment out here. We can turn this uh, symbology on in MIDAS. And you can see this kind of a hexagonal shape. It's got six little wedges in it. And if the wedge is green, it means that degree of freedom is restrained. And so we have all six restrained here. Again, full fixity. Uh, down here at that far abutment, if you start at about 1 o'clock, that is the, the x direction, y, z, and then your rotations. So you can see we have two of the six uh, restrained. We also use spring supports. Uh, we have linear springs to prevent the outer plane motion at the knee of the cross frames. That's something I had just mentioned a few minutes ago. We chose springs because they can limit the motion without drawing a large amount of force uh, to that joint that a rigid support might tend to do. We also had springs to mimic the longitudinal bearing, uh, longitudinal resistance of the bearing at abutment two. And just like these uh, rigid supports, we can turn on symbology for the spring supports as well. And it uses a similar type approach. Again, you've got that hexagonal shape with the six wedges. This time yellow indicates uh, the an active spring. Uh, blue indicates a spring is not applied in that direction. Uh, finally, we used elastic links to help connect model portions at their proper locations. We used rigid elastic links to connect the cross frame 
cross frame nodes at the girders. And I can turn those on as well. And I'll zoom in so we can see. Uh, those composite section elements for, for the girder you know, only have a single node. They're like a frame element. So we needed a second node down here to truly model these cross frames. And that's where we use that rigid elastic constraint to make these pairs of nodes behave like rigid bodies. We also used elastic links at the bearings, at some of the pier bearings. And again, that allows us to connect the bottom of our girder support to the center line of the pier cap. And again, that's what you're seeing here, elastic links. These were not completely rigid. These were elastic, and we could define stiffnesses that corresponded to the uh, uh, stiffness of the elastomeric bearings. We experimented with multiple models that varied uh, the values and or combinations of these boundary conditions and encourage uh, anybody who does any kind of FE modeling to do the same. Uh, your models can be uh, sensitive to, to these values, and you want to make sure that uh, you're forcing the model to behave like the real structure is. Well, I was going to talk next about construction staging. And recall that one of our motivations for using MIDAS was the ability to replicate construction sequencing. And yes, MDX and other programs will handle deck pour sequences, but MIDAS ultimately gives us a resource where we could evaluate girder erection too. That question hasn't been asked, but we suspect it may be coming from the contractor once they get a little farther into construction of this bridge. We had a total of uh, 12 construction stages. The first one being steel erection. Second, we put up deck formwork. Then we had nine deck placements, if you recall that AutoCAD drawing I showed earlier. And then we had a final step, which was curing, just allowing the entire deck to, to harden. Now let me zoom back out so we can see the whole bridge. And I'm going to turn that extruded view back on. And now if I select just the girder erection stage, You can see all the deck elements go away, and we're seeing just the steel girders. That's all we have activated at that stage, as well as the substructure elements. And if I jump ahead and select uh, deck placement one, uh, no visible change. And, and that makes sense, because all we have really done is that is added the load of the wet deck from pore one. If I move forward to pore two, you can see we now have elements activated. These are the elements that were placed in deck pore one. They have now hardened and, and act with the structure. And then we would have the loads for deck placement two acting. And I can show you those just to, so, you, so you trust me. And there's the wet deck loads for, for pore two. And so you can cycle through this and see how we keep adding uh, loads and, and deck elements, uh, and essentially until you've got your entire bridge built. So the activation of these uh, loads and elements and boundary conditions is, is controlled with this construction stage dialog. And I can jump in and, and take a look at just one stage. Here we're seeing uh, the placement of, of region three on the deck. We are, we are saying that the elements, the dummy deck elements that were placed in stage two should now be active. They will contribute stiffness. No change in boundary conditions. And then we've activated the, the load that is wet concrete in deck placement three. This is also nice that you can go in here and view current stage information. And this really shows you the cumulative effects. So you can see all the load groups currently active at this point, all the boundary groups, all the nodes and elements. Also required when you do this uh, stage construction analysis is the composite section for construction staging. And so that's an entry up here. And if I open up one of these, you can see we, we are seeing our composite element. 
And it consists of two parts, again, the concrete deck, the steel girder, so part one and part two. Down here, we're able to tell it when these parts are activated. So part one, the steel girder, gets activated at the active stage, which in this case is steel erection. And then the deck will not be activated until deck P2. And that's when it becomes a hardened element. It adds stiffness. And so you can see we had to define 40 of these properties as well, uh, one each to match the 40 composite section properties we had previously defined. Uh, one of the final items to define was loads. We had a total of 20 static load cases. Uh, we had uh, self-weight of the uh, structural steel, uh, additional weight of the steel, uh, way to stay in place formwork, uh, and then weight of all the deck pores, a dead load on composite, wearing surface load, thermal, and, and two seismic loads. Uh, again, the program has the ability to, to display any of these loads, so here's the, uh, you know, the weight of the wet concrete and, and haunch that happens in pore six, and again, we can turn that on and, and look at it. One of the other things we did with this model was a uh, modal analysis. Uh, it was not required for anything in particular we were going to use the model for, but it's a real good way to check your model for improper connectivity. Uh, and what I mean is if you come in, do a modal analysis, start looking at the mode shapes, you'll quickly find any uh, unconnected pieces just kind of flapping around. And so that's a, a real good tool, and I strongly recommend uh, running that you know, anytime you're doing any kind of computational mod in, modeling uh, with any program. Uh, there are a variety of ways to, to get results or output from MIDAS, and I just wanted to show you uh, two useful tools. Uh, the first one is the uh, bridge girder diagram. Uh, this tool is very useful for obtaining results along the length of the girder, which can be cumbersome to obtain in some general purpose uh, finite element programs. Uh, to use this tool, you do have to have a group uh, defined within the program that says, hey, all these elements make up one girder line. But at that point, the program is smart enough to then pull results and order them sequentially along the girder. Uh, it's probably best seen with an example. So if I click that, let's go ahead and look at forces. We'll look at the moment. Uh, let's look after we've placed the wearing surface. And let's just select uh, girder three. And apply. And you can see we end up with the uh, bending moment diagram along the length of that girder. So again, a, a useful tool for uh, bridge engineers and a good way to get results. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, was the dynamic report tool. And let's see. So we're going to just say, yeah, let's make a new dynamic report. It's going to open up a Word document here where we can drag and drop uh, tables, pictures, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, just for example purposes, I'll drag a picture in there. So you can see we can take our thermal displacement over here. Now, the reason this is called dynamic is that uh, the program is, is smart enough, it has a link between this report and MIDAS, that if we go in and update things in our MIDAS model, the report will automatically update the items we had imported into it. So, uh, again, it could be a big time saver if you're uh, generating a lot of reports and adjusting your model quite frequently. Well, at this point, I'm going to jump back out of MIDAS and go back to the PowerPoint presentation, and we'll take a look at uh, some of the results we had and how they compared with uh, you know, MDX. 
So the first thing we looked at was the total vertical load of the bridge. Uh, so this is just summing up all your vertical reactions. And we did it at the stage of just directing the steel. Uh, the second, second column is after the, the deck is cured. Uh, then after we've placed composite dead load, then after we've placed the wearing surface. Uh, and you can see that both MIDAS and MDX are, are, are you know, almost spot on, giving us the same total vertical load in there. And this also agreed with hand calcs. So that gave us some confidence that uh, within both programs, we had defined our, our model um, correctly. Uh, take it one step deeper. Uh, how are those vertical loads being distributed amongst the substructure units? And so here you can see we've plotted total uh, vertical reaction after the last deck placement at all the substructure units. Again, the blue bars being MIDAS, the, the red cross-hatching being MDX. And you can see the, the total vertical reaction as you see these substructure units in, uh, agreed very well. We take it down one more step. Uh, at a given substructure or pier, uh, how are the reactions of the girders themselves? How do they compare? Uh, here you see the uh, vertical reactions at Pier 3, again, MIDAS and MDX uh, exhibiting good correlation at girders. Uh, this is girder 1, girder 2, girder 3. Interestingly, though, if you jump to a different pier, uh, we, did, we didn't have as good a correlation here. Uh, and now, it's, it's a bit misleading because this scale on this graph is, is not as, as big. Those are only increments of 10 kips. These were 20, so we're not as far off as that indicates. We're generally within 9%, I think it was. So again, the two models uh, doing a slightly different job distributing the forces uh, across the girders. We could also come in and look at uh, the, the reactions or results from incremental uh, loading. So the graph on the left is the uh, total cumulative reaction at the end of each placement. So deck placement one, two, three, and so on, all the way up to the last one. Uh, both MIDAS and MDX uh, doing a, a good job of, of matching each other. Again, we're looking at a single girder line at a given pier right here. This graph looks at the same girder line and pier and just looks at the incremental, incremental changes as you go from pull one, two, two to three, and so on. Uh, well, we're pretty satisfied at that point with all the, the vertical reactions, so we moved on to moments. Um, I should point out at this point, we, we did not get to the point of looking at live load on this bridge. Um, we, we carried it all the way up through dead load. Uh, that was partly due to, to time constraints and available uh, time and budget. Uh, that is something we would like to spend some more time with in the future, though, is the live loading capabilities within MIDAS. Uh, but here you're seeing the uh, moment due to the self-weight of girder 3. Uh, the solid red line is MDX, and uh, the blue dots are MIDAS, so uh, you know, perfectly overlaying each other. We could also come in and look at it uh, in, for each pour. So again, here's girder 3. Uh, we're looking at the, the total unfactor moment after placement 1, after deck placement 3, 5, 7, and up to 9. And again, good correlation throughout. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is uh, the ability to get your, your MIDAS output, uh, element versus part. You know, we talked about those composite section uh, properties and elements a little bit earlier. They had part one and part two, the girder and the deck. Uh, the graph you see on the left here is the moment acting on just the steel girder portion, uh, girder three after uh, the composite dead load. And you can see we've got a little disparity here between MDX and, and MIDAS. If I come over here to this plot, I've obtained the, the moment output for the whole element. So that's parts one plus two. And it, it matches uh, almost perfectly. And it should, again, because that is the total demand moment on that element. This, this graph was just looking at the moment in the girder. The slab has to carry some as well. So just something to be cognizant of when you're pulling output from uh, MIDAS. We also looked at girder stresses. Uh, the graph on the left is the factored bottom flange stress uh, along girder line 2. And you can see, again, uh, the two programs yielding uh, very comparable results, even picking up little subtleties, uh, such as the, that, that step right there where I'm assuming section properties probably changed. Uh, the graph on the right shows the factored top flange stresses. A little more disparity there. We've got a, a, a general trend in following between the two programs. 
but what the difference tells us is that uh, MIDAS and MDX are apportioning the loads to the girder and the slab uh, slightly differently. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier uh, when I was talking about our motivation is that this gave us a tool to uh, do other things beyond girder design. Uh, we were wanted to we needed to go in and look at the the bridge under seismic load, and the first thing we looked at is well, what are the what are the girder stresses under seismic load? Do they control, or can we uh, not worry about it and just focus solely on the design that, that we got out of MDX? Uh, a lot of lines on this graph. Uh, what are what are would I draw your attention to is again the, the blue diamonds are the the factored stresses from from Midas, and then the three solid curves are the uh, strength load combinations that we got out of MDX, so strength one, three, and five. And what this plot tells us is that the seismic demands, you can see here, much less than the strength demands. Seismic demands here, magnitude much less than the strength. So nowhere along this graph did the seismic demands control. And that meant that that was a, a, a non-controlling load case, and the design that we obtained for vertical effects out of MDX would cover everything. We carried out a similar uh, study with the cross frames themselves. Again, what are the demands on the cross frames under seismic? Uh, this graph right here plots the uh, tensile demands in the, in the diagonals of the cross frames between girders one and two. Uh, th there were 34 cross frames along the length of that bay. That's what you're seeing here. And again, blue solid lines is earthquake, red uh, cross hatching, uh, strength one. And so you come in and look, did my, did my seismic ever exceed my strength? It's a lot easier to, to look at it on a span-by-span -span basis. So here's a, a plot for just uh, span four. In this case, the strength always controlled. There were a couple areas, so here's span one, where the seismic uh, demands did exceed the strength demands. You can see in cross frame number one, cross frame number eight. Uh, however, we just got to be smart enough to say, well, boy, come over here these strength demands are higher than that. So again, seismic is not going to control. Well, that's what I wanted to, to walk everybody through today. Again, showed you a little bit of, uh, of how we developed the MIDAS model and uh, how we used some of the results we obtained and how they compared to another commercial program out there. Uh, for conclusions, I'd say that MIDAS is, is you know, definitely very capable of modeling curved steel plate girders with composite deck and construction sequencing. The dead load demands were in excellent agreement with other commercial design programs. And the MIDAS was a, a very flexible program. There were multiple ways to do any given task, and it can accommodate uh, many different uh, scenarios or, or sequences. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Jay. Okay. okay. Uh Hi, um, this is Beta here again. Uh, before Jeff uh, signs off, there were a couple questions that I do see that uh, a couple people were uh, okay. you know, inquiring about. So I was wondering if Jeff, if you could actually take some time to answer a couple of the people's questions. It might be yeah, a good time to you know, kind of like explain a couple of the steps you took as well as kind of uh, like network around with the engineers. Uh, I do see that a few questions were uh, requested in, so I'm not sure if you could see it. But there's a I, questions tab. If you just tap on it, you should be able to look into it. Yeah, I just opened that, so let me uh, scroll through here. Perfect. Um, it seems like everyone just starting to ask questions now. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> well, we'll limit it down to however many that you could answer, uh, however many yeah. you are comfortable with, and yeah, anything beyond the time. Video. We'll take the questions in, and we'll just uh, we'll forward them over to Jeff uh, via email so he could answer a couple of the questions, and then we could get back to the individuals if we run out of time. Okay. Yep. So, uh, Jeff, uh, if you will, uh, at this time, if you could kind of cover a couple of the questions that people are asking. Sure, I'm going through it. looks like uh majority were audio. <laughs> so. Yeah, if you scroll to the bottom, it seems like yeah, starting from, I got it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, there was a question, why not use weightless plate elements for the deck? Um, Again, with this particular model, we were using Midas's composite section properties so that it's able to have a, a, a slab and a, a girder. Uh, they are separate. This allows us to control to follow the um, 
you know, the construction sequencing, you're putting your girder up first and you're casting your slab. Um, so we didn't need to bring in separate plate elements for the deck. Um, you could obviously use traditional frame elements and plate elements to develop a, a three-dimensional model of the, of the bridge. Uh, you know, either approach is acceptable and, and can be done within MIDAS, so, so hopefully that answers uh, that first question. Um, Let's see, cross frame, how did cross frame forces compare between MDX and MIDAS? Well, without live load being put into the MIDAS model, it uh, was not the most straightforward, uh, there was not a straightforward way to get those numbers out. What we ultimately need to do is, is get a MIDAS model with live load in it, and then we could start looking at the two. Um, Again, you know that that's an issue that uh, we would like to spend some more time with. Just we're not able to get to that point with this uh, project. Did we compare deflections from MDX and Midas? Uh, my recollection is we did, and that they were uh, within good agreement for each other. Uh, by good agreement, I would say you know on the order of um, an inch, if I'm, I'm working from memory here. But you know we had deflections that were. We're getting up there as a ways with some of these spans. Uh, why didn't we use a full 3D model as opposed to a grid type model with cross frames defined and connected to the girders with rigid links? Um, again, just I guess just a choice given the the uh, what we hope to accomplish and the, and the time and budget that we had. Uh, we we felt this was a good way to get into. Uh, the MIDAS program. Um, I think when you ask about a full 3D model, you might be referring to uh, discretizing the girder with shell elements. Um, again, but that is uh, just not a, not an option we had pursued at this time. Notice that this model did not remove wet concrete deck loads. How do you avoid double loading? or the deck element.